The sea floor west of the Oregon and Northern California coast just sent up a flare, and the message is simple and unsettling. The system is alive, it is breathing, and it is loading. A moderate offshore earthquake, measured as magnitude 5.8, struck far out to sea, roughly 165 kilometers west-southwest of Port Orford, Oregon, at four minutes past four after midnight, coordinated universal time on Tuesday the 9th of September, 2025, at a depth of roughly 13.8 kilometers. In plain terms, that is about 103 miles from the coast and about eight and a half miles down on the northern piece of the Gorda Ridge, a submarine spreading system that feeds stress directly into the southern end of the Cascadia subduction zone. There was no tsunami warning or threat issued, a crucial early distinction confirmed by the United States Tsunami Warning System. But the absence of a tsunami is not the end of the story, it is the beginning of a harder set of questions. Why there, why now, and what does a mid-sized ridge event really do to the fault that ominously parallels the coast from Northern California past Oregon and Washington to Vancouver Island? How much of this is ordinary tectonic breathing, and how much is a sign that the locked interface deeper to the east is ratcheting closer to failure? And if the offshore system is flexing, which segment of Cascadia matters most tonight? Start by grounding the basic facts. The earthquake's epicenter sits near the North Gorda Ridge, one of three echelon segments that, together with short transform offsets, compose a slow but persistent oceanic spreading center bounded by the Blanco Transform to the north and the Mendocino Transform to the south. It is a plate factory. New oceanic crust oozes and fractures there as the Pacific Plate pulls away from the small but stubborn Gorda Plate. That newborn crust does not peacefully age in place. Instead, it is shoved northeastward where it bends and dives beneath North America along the Cascadia Megathrust, a famously quiet yet historically ferocious subduction fault capable of unleashing nine-class earthquakes and trans-Pacific tsunamis. In this sense, the 5.8 is not a random offshore hiccup. It is part of the conveyor belt that sets the boundary conditions for Cascadia's stress budget. The location matters because ridge events and transform quakes at the Mendocino Triple Junction region have a unique leverage on the southern Cascadia margin. The Triple Junction is the tectonic crossroads near Cape Mendocino, where the Pacific, North America and Gorda Plates meet. It is a mechanical choke point in which the San Andreas transform system to the south, the Mendocino transform to the west, and the subduction interface to the north and east exchange stress. Studies of seafloor structure and magnetic anomaly patterns across the Gorda Basin show that the Gorda block is not a simple rigid plate. It warps, it buckles, and it hosts internal left lateral shears and north-south compression. That internal distortion is not abstract theory. It manifests as intraplate earthquakes within the Gorda slab, occasionally large, and as swarms along the ridge segments. Each time the ridge or the short transforms fail in moderate events, the stress field is reweighted, and some fraction of that change is felt down dip along the locked megathrust that underlies the outer continental shelf and coast. If you want a visceral feel for why this 5.8 raised eyebrows among geologists and emergency managers, consider how load paths work along a coupled fault network. The ridge is a divergent boundary where magma infill and normal faulting accommodate extension. Those ruptures, even when they are modest, alter the Coulomb stress on nearby faults. To the south and east of the ridge lies the Mendocino Transform, a right lateral shear zone that slices toward the coast. To the northeast lies the down dip locked patch of the Cascadia Megathrust. A ridge event can reduce stress on some neighbouring fault planes, but increase it on others. At the triple junction, the geometry favours stress increases on parts of both the Mendocino transform and the shallowest up-dip portion of the subduction interface. The effect is not deterministic. No single five-class quake triggers a nine-class megathrust rupture. But in a system in which the fault is already storing centuries of strain, modest adds and subtracts matter. The present quake's depth, around eight and a half miles, and its position on or adjacent to ridge-parallel normal faults suggest it participated in that redistribution.
The key investigative issue is whether those changes are being echoed by deeper or a long strike signals elsewhere in the system this week. Those echoes, intriguingly, often appear as tremor and slow slip. Cascadia has a well-documented phenomenon known as episodic tremor and slip, where deep, down-dip patches of the plate interface slide quietly for days to weeks every year or two, accompanied by swarms of non-volcanic tremor at depths of roughly 30 to 50 plus kilometers, or about 19 to 31 miles. These are not conventional earthquakes, they are long-duration, low-frequency, almost breath-like exhalations of the subduction machine. During these episodes, high-precision GPS even records short-term reversals in surface motion as the overlying plate relaxes westward by a few millimetres. The tremor often migrates a long strike at 10 or so kilometres per day, about 6 miles per day. Tracing the interface where fluids, temperature and pressure conspire to weaken the fault temporarily. The tremor catalogues maintained by the Regional Seismic Network and new near-real-time slow-slip detection pipelines provide a way to watch whether the deep engine is currently in a slipping or quiescent phase. When deep slow-slip is active, the locked patch immediately updip can experience a subtle increase in stress rate, as if a hand were leaning on a door from below while the latch is still engaged. That is one reason why a discrete ridge quake arriving during or just after an episode can draw extra scrutiny. The system may already be in a different frictional state. Right now, the shallow facts are clear. A moderate ridge event, no tsunami warning, light to no felt reports on shore because of the offshore distance and the oceanic path. But the deeper context is complicated and deserves careful unpacking. The southern Cascadia margin is widely thought to be the most vulnerable segment for a partial rupture both because of its proximity to the Mendocino Triple Junction stress soup and because paleoseismic work suggests that many of the last several dozen Great Cascadia events did not rupture the entire margin from California to Canada. Instead, many were sectional failures, frequently favouring the southern half. Stratigraphic records compiled from coastal marshes and submarine turbidites show a tapestry of event sizes and extents with some truly margin-wide monsters and many more partials. Hazard models for the Pacific Northwest explicitly include both whole margin magnitude 9 up to perhaps 9.2 scenarios and partial ruptures in the upper 8 class, roughly 8.0 to 8.7, with weights assigned to each scenario based on the geologic record. In the language of risk science, the hazard is additive. Both families of ruptures contribute to the likelihood of damaging ground motions in any given time window. This means the question the 5.8 begs is not merely could it trigger the big one, which is the wrong question, but what does it say about where the southern interface is on its long, slow march toward either another partial or a whole margin failure? To answer that, it helps to visualise the mechanical stack. From west to east across the margin, you pass over the spreading ridge, then transform segments, then the outer rise where the incoming plate begins to bend, then the trench, then the accretionary prism where sediments are scraped off, and then the locked megathrust that dips beneath the coast. At shallow depths near the trench, the interface is often weakly coupled and can creep or host slow slip because high fluid pressures and low normal stresses lubricate the contact. Farther landward and deeper, the temperature and pressure sweet spot produces a famously locked patch an interseismic vice that has been tightening since the last full-scale rupture around the year 1700. Down dip of that locked patch, the interface transitions into the tremor and slow slip zone where conditions promote episodic failure. One can think of the locked zone as a spring, the slow slip zone as a metronome, and the ridge transform complex as a flickering array of weights thrown onto the system. When a ridge quake occurs, it can alter bending stresses in the incoming slab, adjust the orientation of principal stresses at the triple junction, and modestly bump the load on the shallowest megathrust. On the time scale of days to weeks, these changes are minor, but on the centuries-long timeline of megathrust recurrence, they are part of the inevitable randomness that determines exactly which cascade of patches let go and when. There is also the matter of seismic swarms inland and along neighbouring faults. Observers this month have noted scattered clusters in Nevada, in the Cascade Volcano Belt, 
and within the creeping stretch of the central San Andreas near Parkfield. None of that means a chain reaction is underway. The West is a large and busy tectonic engine with many independent parts. Still, the central San Andreas near Parkfield has a famous quasi-regularity. Six moderate events in historical times separated by roughly two decades on average, with the last in 2004, which raises a lot of knowing eyebrows each time that interval grows long. The creeping section farther north tends to shed frequent small quakes and a seismic slip, while the locked southern San Andreas awaits its own overdue release. The ridge 5.8 does not change the physics of those faults, but it does remind us that the system is a web, not a set of isolated lines on a map. What fails in one corner perturbs the rest. Investigating the mechanism of this event and its neighbourhood begins with focal mechanisms and bathymetric context. The Gorda Ridge is classic mid-ocean ridge topography, a high axial volcanic zone and flanking normal faults that bound subsiding grabbins. Earthquakes here most often display normal faulting solutions, consistent with extension as the ridge opens by centimetres per year. Detailed USGS work and global catalogues show that the Gorda plate between the ridge and the trench is unusual in its internal deformation. It is cut by left lateral and northeast trending faults induced by the torque of the Mendocino transform and by coupling with North America farther east. That means a quake plotted on the ridge is not always purely ridge normal faulting. Some are oblique or even strike slip if they occur on the transforms or within a rotating Gorda block sliver. Regardless of the exact nodal plane, the energy release for a five-class event is sufficient to be registered across the Pacific Northwest's broadband network and even Whispersoft by distant stations in Nevada and Southern California, as operators reported, but far too small and far too deep to disturb the ocean surface enough to generate a tsunami. That last point matters. Tsunamis in Cascadia require significant vertical displacement of the seafloor near the trench or significant landsliding or slumping. A normal faulting ridge event well offshore and away from the trench axis rarely meets that criterion, and it did not today. For the record, and for those who will check, the official event page lists the magnitude, time, and location that framed this analysis. The National Tsunami Center's information statement clarifies the absence of a warning or threat for this event. A number of reputable regional networks and research efforts are tracking tremor and slow slip, providing near real-time context in the days ahead. The story thus remains technically straightforward but contextually rich. A moderate ridge earthquake, no tsunami, a sensitive southern Cascadia margin, and a chance to read the machine with clear eyes. If the Gorda Ridge is the metronome of new crust, and the tremor zone is the metronome of deep slip, then the coast is the metronome of our memory. Tonight is a good night to set them all to the same beat. If this update helped you out, smash that like button, share this video with everyone you know, and hit subscribe with the notification bell on so you never miss a critical alert. And hey, tap that hype icon to spread this even wider and get the word out to a larger audience. The more people who know, the safer we all are. Stay safe, stay alert, and I'll catch you in the next update.